Greetings. Greetings. And welcome to a uh, discussion of the plumb line. Um, the plumb line is a metaphor that we use, um, that Richard has used for years and years in his teaching, um, to describe what the embodied feeling of balance is. And in these periods, both as we enter in, uh, there's absolute chaos. We're thrown off of balance on many, many levels. And just as we thought we had it together, here we can come out of our imposed um, isolation, um, or we have to stay there, and the feelings of imbalance can be intensified. So we thought it might be helpful to talk a little about the embodied sense of being balanced, how to access that, and then um, put it in context uh, that's a little bigger than our own experience of it. So metaphorically, there is this idea of the plumb line. And maybe if you explain what that <laughs> is. Okay. So plumb line, if you're an architect or an engineer or just a, someone who actually deals with the world, literally, uh, you're familiar with the plumb bob, you know, a string and it has a little thing on the bottom. And that's where you discover the true vertical line. Um, and so that's our basic, and so if you know about plumb bobs, you also know about spirit levels, and you can research that on your own. Um, but we often begin our asana practice with samastitihi. So here today I will demonstrate samastitihi, and we're standing on our sitting bones for practical reasons, but you can still feel it. And, and if you're at home, you can yeah, if you're stand at home, up, you can feel free to stand. Yeah. And so, if you sit, uh, and it's good to stand up, because then it's, there's more consequences to not, to not paying attention. Uh, you'll fall over. Uh, or you can do uh, the headstand, which is simply samastitihi upside down, or samastitihi on top of a tall flagpole, don't actually do it, um, and you'll start to find it. And then when you're actually balancing, what are you meditating on? What are you focusing on? And that, and your mind will start to answer that question and say, oh, I'm meditating on the plumb line. And then if you find yourself in samastitihi, uh, keep asking that question, what is it that I'm actually meditating on? And we find that if you grasp onto an idea of the plumb line, even an image, you then soon after that lose your balance and you're thrown off. And so basically the plumb line When you get it, it disappears. You disappear, it disappears. And so it's a, and this is what we do in our uh, asana practice, and then in our pranayama practice, our sitting practice, the beginning stages, the, where you're actually dropping down onto the planet Earth. Uh, um, we are going back and forth uh, with, one, you know, sensations as, so if I'm sitting here in samastitihi or samastitihi, uh, what is probably happening is I'm actually going too far forward some of the time and then, whoa, and then catch myself and rock too far back, whoa. Uh, and this can be, happen on a microscopic level. And then sometimes just due to habit, I'll really ground my left sitting bone and sit there the way I habitually do. Okay, but oop, I missed the plumb line. And so then there's a compensation and we go to the other side. And so the plumb line is identified by a dialogue back and forth, front to back, and then side to side. Okay. And the actual plumb line 
you just have to, you, what is it I'm actually meditating? What's it actually look like? So you'll create an image of it, but then if you almost stumble into it by accident, you forget the image. And so you, you sense into this, as Richard said, front to back and side to side. And then as you get more balanced, um, if you can let go of the idea of what it means to balance, then you start recognizing you're balancing inside to outside and up to down as well. So it's not just the four corners, but there are more. Many corners. And eventually what happens is we drop in to balancing between past and future in our thoughts. So essentially it's a way of waking up to being present. Um, and it starts with just noticing breath. part of it. Yeah, yeah, the breath. So our basic thing that we'll look at is prana and apana, two ends of the same stick the, in a wave pattern. And when the prana is active, the heart is floating, and it opens you up, it's like the top of a tree, blossoming, flowering, bearing fruits. And then, the apana, it's opposite, when you exhale, everything falls from the tree, and rooting occurs, and rooting into that common ground that we tend to share uh, with all other beings. Okay. And so the, the basic formula is whenever you are, the prana is active and you're inhaling, you keep in the background, you keep in your attention the opposite, the best of the inhale. So when you're inhaling, you want to feel the grounding pattern of the exhale, okay, which is the feeling that you have a tail, a coccyx in the back of the pelvic floor, and a rising and spreading of the lower back of the diaphragm. So we do, when we inhale, we feel that. When we exhale, and everything shifts completely, when you exhale, you have to hold the best quality of the inhale, which is the openness of the heart. And in that way, you're pouring back and forth, prana into apana, Pana and the prana. It turns out that being two ends of the same stick, um, in mythology they become they are represented as two lovers, and they actually are totally in love, crazy for each other, and they exist for each other, back and forth. Hmm. So easier said than done, like a lot of this yoga. Okay. So when we inhale and we come to the very top of the inhale. If the exhale pattern is supporting the inhale pattern and is all excited, cheering her on, yes, I love it, okay. Then at the very top of the inhale, the upper lobes of the lungs start to automatically open and the muscles up here, the scalene muscles tongue, and if the palate is released as if you were actually paying really close attention or like um, practicing your drishti, your calm gaze and you're feeling your... What happens then is you relax the palate and what is awakened is uddhanavayu, which is a form of the prana from here up over the top of the head. And this is a feeling of intrinsic dignity. So, at the top of the inhale, ah, the sense of intrinsic dignity. When you exhale, the breath starts to flow out. And this is viscerally feeling the dissolution of all of the imaginary patterns, sense object patterns, thought patterns, that the prana had manifested in time and space. Aspirations, fears, hatreds, uh, questions, all of those things, all of the bubbles 
pop and they go back into the present moment. And so, when you exhale in this basic practice, you have to keep that sense of intrinsic dignity in order to keep the plumb line. Okay. And so the plumb line is really what uh, allows us to keep connected, to keep ourselves connected to Earth. And so even if during this time of the virus where you've been on lockdown and you're feeling rather disheveled and your intrinsic dignity seems to be something of the past because you've been wearing the same house clothes for weeks on end and you've not had a haircut in months and yeah. all of those... It's not intrinsic in that case. Yeah. Dependent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that we identify with some of these external forms like that. And, and the trick that we can do to remind ourselves that those external things that we are relying on, especially in times like these, that we're relying on to feel balanced, um, that they are simply part of the context that allows us to touch in with something that's already there, that intrinsic uh, capacity for balance, which, as you pointed out the other day, uh, you know, when you're an actual plumber or a, an architect using a plumb line, it's always straight up and down. But in yoga, we put our bodies in all kinds of different positions, and yet in all of the different asanas, what makes them stira and sukha is that sense of dialectic revealing the middle path. And so when we're doing samasthiti or upside down samasthiti called the headstand, um, or just sitting with good posture, the actual um, architect's plumb line corresponds to our plumb line. And so there's a beautiful image um, that uh, Krishnamacharya used. And uh, he was saying when chanting, uh, or when exhaling, you, you sit and you imagine that you're balancing a lemon on the crown of your head. And so you have to like rise up into it. There's no sense of it being a heavy lemon. Oh, the burden of wearing a crown. But it's like the intrinsic dignity, the uttana, it's up, comes up. And as you exhale, you don't lose that because the lemon falls off and that's considered like, you know, start over again. Yeah. So if you have a lemon at home, you can try this. And this is, that sense, will keep your palate released and your tongue completely empty. And it allows the feeling that everything dissolves back into the present moment and drops down onto the earth. And so this is just the basic beginning alignment uh, in the dialogue or the dialectic front to back and side to side of yoga asana and pranayama. That and so we have the tool of our bodies uh, for uh, bringing into the present moment the sen physical sensations, the visceral sensations of being in, in a state of balance or equanimity. Um, and it's a good thing within your practice, as you're doing your asana practice, sitting practices, to or chanting practices, or taking care of family practices, to really tap into the feeling within the body of being balanced or being off kilter, because what happens, and an example of uh, what happens is, you know, if you've ever seen like a three-legged dog that some misfortune happened to and it had lost one of its legs, and dogs are very adept at this, they figure out a way around the imbalance of having lost a leg. Um, and for us, when we become imbalanced physically, um, we often will adapt and um, 
but sometimes not so elegantly as you might have seen in Three-Legged Dogs. And so even though on some level we have found a way of functioning, the intrinsic sense of dignity or the balance that is there, whether it's from having a sacrum that's a little out or having a jaw that's too tight, um, um, those things start to throw us off kilter. And then we lose um, the ability to really see what is balance all about, because we've been focusing the mind and deciding, well, I, I have to have an image and a picture of, of balance. And so I'm going to try to create something rather than letting it unfold. And, and part of the balance of that is different layers beyond the physicality. So we wanted to remind you also that especially in times like these, but you know, we keep saying in times like these as if this is a limited um, period in, in our lives, which hopefully it is, this particular event. But in fact, there are always crises, changes, difficulties, um, life situations that throw us off balance. Um, and so physically, if we can use that as the ground for finding balance, we then can start to notice that there are other almost sheaths or layers of balance, like the balanced mind, stability yeah. of mind, yeah. that is very difficult if the body's off balance. Because yeah. the prana of the body, the sensation patterns, cause the manifestation of the mind patterns. Mm -hmm. And then if the mind, if you're not attentive and notice that, then the bodily patterns, the habits, samskaras, causing the different habits and prana movement, they're reinforced. Mm -hmm. And you're just taken off into who knows where. La la land. Yeah, la la land. <laughs> um, and these, you know, you, you run into that with mental um, obscurations and you met, run into that with uh, emotional turmoil that you might feel. Um, and you lose balance that way. Um, intellectually, you might. Um, and then there are ways we get off of balance also um, in terms of interaction with the world. So we become isolated. And then, you know, we've talked about this in the past few lectures too, but where you feel almost too stable and static and tamasic, at which point it isn't balance, it's the stick in the mud phenomenon, um, which we've probably all experienced at different points, where interaction with the world is uh, compromised. And that's one of the interesting things about the big idea of balance is that, as Richard was saying, you can't really name what it is that you do, but it is contextual. So but if the you're on... would love to name it. Oh, yeah. And then I've got it. And then now the ego is going to be eternal and reign over all other beings. Sorry about that, sentient beings, but you are now the servants of the... Uh, anyone's particular ego. Yeah. It's quite a slippery slope. It is. And, and you know, just thinking back to being on a flagpole, standing on top of a flagpole, and if that's too easy for you, stand on one foot on top of a flagpole, and in a wind. In the wind. <laughs> and that's the context. So that, you know, and if that's too easy for you, stand on your tiptoes. Do a headstand. Yeah, on top, top of a flagpole. A uh, uh, flagpole is proper. Yeah, in the, in the wind. And so bringing in all of these elements of context, and then another she that can really throw us off balance in a in a more uh, kind of global sense in terms of our being in the world is when we get thrown off balance ethically or morally um, by confusion or by 
and usually the confusion is a result of separating ourselves out from the background, out from the context, out from other people, um, which, by the way, is the uh, sort of knee-jerk response that you have when you're off balance, is to, to kind of try to separate yourself and take care of yourself only. Um, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally. And then the, the rub is that when you do that, it gets worse. Yeah. And you cut yourself off. Mm-hmm. Um, out of desperation almost, you grasp your, either your image of the plumb line or the, you know, in all of its senses, or you grasp some formula. That's it. And then you're no longer holding as important, you're holding that formula or that image or that metaphor. It could be a great metaphor, but you're holding it. Oh, this is what's important. When, no, that metaphor has to slide and disappear into the plumb line. Mm -hmm. Because what's important is all other beings. And so when we're talking in the beginning of this talk and saying, you know, as you find your physical balance, you're finding it front to back and side to side and up and down and and inside to outside. And in that space that in the beginning starts to be experienced as, you know, spreading the kidney wings and uniting the prana with the apana. But where that evolves into is this sense of there is in a way, a metaphorical plumb line for the whole um, planet as one um, really interesting, um, interpenetrating, interconnecting group of individuals and, and events that are going on at the same time, which is something at this point in history that is highly unique. Um, in terms of our ability to look at how the, if you would like to call it, the plumb line of healthy, balanced ecosystems and earth, how that is actually our inside, outside um, communication and connection to, to the whole. Um, and so when you, we talk about these layers, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the, um, you know, the metaphorical, the, uh, what one of the things that, that we start to see is that those are the layers that we start to create when we are trying to understand the idea of what it means to find this idea of the plumb line when we're going deeply in and looking deeply inside ourselves. But then when you get so deep in that you realize there's infinity there and you can turn and look back the other way, you can see that this, there is a layering out in the opposite direction as well, um, where the plumb line is also being, it is manifesting if things are in balance. And so it's this really amazing thing that we learn through the embodied practice in our yoga practices of doing just simple things like utita hasta parangushtasana or, you know, or just uh, standing on one foot um, with our hand on the wall or a hand on a chair, if, if that's what it takes. Um, to, to recognize that, you know, a balanced posture is really fine if you're using the wall or the chair because you are working in context with your circumstances and with your environment. And that becomes our sort of um, baseline when we can feel physically balanced to understand the more esoteric and the more um, sort of global meaning of what it is to be balanced, even under challenging circumstances. And it's fascinating to look at, at what balance is 
from the esoteric perspective. <laughs> yeah, and then when you arrive at an explanation of balance, yeah. it's probably metaphorical. And so you have to let go of your excellent, your brilliant explanation, <laughs> uh, even though it's your dissertation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a lovely image is um, if you're doing headstand, say, with, you know, as if you were intrinsically dignified. In other words, you're being crowned with the planet Earth. Okay, we should talk about big crowns. And in this part of the galaxy, planet Earth is obviously the most amazing crown. And imagine you're just putting it on top of the head. And um, any structure of your mind of you, you are merely the servant of that which is in the center of the heart, which is being crowned. So it's, and you're placing this crown on the head, and this gives all the proper alignment through all the different layers of the body, and then, ah, okay. But a very cool thing about you know, the actual practice of yoga is that because of the shape of the planet being more or less spherical, if I were to do the headstand, you know, and they go, wow, uh, it's a big crown, and it's a crown that's large enough for all of us to wear simultaneously. So uh, that's Richard's goal in life, is to get all of everyone on to Earth the headstand, and that'll at solve the same moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which actually, unfortunately, would look a little like a coronavirus thing at the moment, but let's not think about that. <laughs> Sorry to ruin that image. <laughs> um, and so, of course, metaphor, metaphor is uh, a very important thing. So if I'm doing, say, the triangle pose, so architecturally, but the plumb line is something that's coming up, um, you know, somewhere above the sacrum in the triangle pose. And so, but, so we change the metaphor to the middle path, mm -hmm. which is referring to when I balance uh, the pelvic floor, and when I balance front to back, left to right, and then at any level along the spine, along our middle path, uh, we are balanced uh, with whatever the theme of that level is. So left to right, front to back, and then all of the different things in between. Uh, when we come up to ah, the top, as we were talking about, uh, like at the top of the inhale, at that very top, the tongue, if you let go of the upper back of the palate, the tongue becomes quiet. Okay, and then at that point, uh, the prana is said to drop down, way, way, way down, or the, yeah, to the level of the navel. And so a pana is actually drawn up as on a string. So a pana is functioning all over the place because it's the drainage pattern uh, back to earth. So there's a pana all over the place. But in your particular body, there's a little valve, metaphorical, of course, where we pull this little string of imagination up like that at the middle of the pelvic floor. And that keeps the prana, which lives in the heart, down here too. So the prana has come down to the plane of the navel, and then it's beloved because it comes up and this is considered to be the uh, initial stages of waking up uh, what they call kundalini. So remember kunda means wrapped up in a coil. And so the image of a serpent of course arises. The serpents are very interesting images uh, in this. And so meaning that Kundalini has to do with slithering things that have 
usually escaped uh, our mental formulations. And the formulations mentally that are caused by the uh, presence of ego functioning too far in the background. And so whenever, you know, a single formula or a single metaphor or a, a single anything is grasped, uh, it is, cannot contain itself. Okay, looks, my hand can grasp anything, but it's really hard for your hand to grasp itself. My mouth, if I'm hungry enough, I could eat the entire world. We're working on that. But can the mouth eat itself? Experiments are being conducted on that. Okay. And so, if something cannot contain itself, okay, there's what is called, it slips out of its own definitions and it becomes what's called residue or shesha, which also refers to serpents. And so this has slipped out. And so for all of these metaphors, anything that is incomplete, there's a leftover. It's like um, the metaphor is sometimes invokes the, the image of, of disgusting things things you don't want to deal with. Uh, uh, and you can research that <laughs> on your own. But these things have slipped out of the, you know, the, the beauty of our own ego systems. Ego, not eco, ego systems. Okay, and so this slime has fallen out, and that's called shesha, and it's just gone on the ground. And so what we mean by kundalini is that the silencing or the stunning of the mind by the release of the language function allows the all of the different pana patterns of shesha which are endless mis miscellaneous meaning you can recategorize them you can even categorize them as shesha or this is garbage but then the category garbage has to be recycled too Okay, so you got to recycle everything. So once there's that natural stunning, or it's an intuitive like, then it flows into the middle path. And they say it's just like a snake going into a hole. So if you've ever actually dealt with snakes, like in the jungle, you're, they're quick. And they go and, what happened? It's gone. And so that image of the Kundalini uh, is basic to this practice. It all is flowing in that direction. And, and you know, one of the, um, something that is, is not uncommon these days in yoga is to go off on a sidetrack uh, thinking, well, I'm going to wake up my kundalini. Um, as, as if waking up the kundalini is something that is a goal to be attained, or as if it is something that you can then hold on to as this kundalini awakening. Um, and so if you have experienced that... Then you can, then that, you can sell it, or you can... Yeah. Profit, the ego yeah. can profit from it. Or it can, can backfire. Oh. Because, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes we have students who come and say, oh my God, I've been having these weird feelings whenever I meditate and, and I do these kinds of jerky things and I, I'm pretty sure it's the kundalini waking up. And it's possible that the kundalini is beginning to wake up, but what is actually happening at that moment is something that is not balanced. The, we wanted to talk a little about kundalini today because kundalini is a um, it is kind of the, the image is, is very powerful, but it really signifies a state of absolute balance on all of these levels, mental, physical, emotional, theoretical, intuitive, you know, levels that we, we might be out of balance on. Kundalini is something that is um, smooth and even and the, when the when the shesha wakes up and and you know takes that form, it's not something that is um, something to grasp hold of. 
And that's, a, you know, that's just a temptation because it, there is this associated sense whenever you feel balanced, there's an associated um, sense of, well, I want that state, right? Yeah. And so the, um, we get a taste of it. It's just like with yoga, you know, you get, oh, I feel so good, and then I feel so good, and then we just out of habit. And so it's important that within the traditions that the, the thousands and thousands of years of yoga traditions that come from the intersections of many, many cultures, um, there's a saying that hardly anyone experiences this, meaning that with, within this experience there's no separate sense. And so often the Kundalini is represented as the serpent of infinity, mm-hmm. and the, in mythology that serpent exists only to serve all other beings, and it's very shy and doesn't want anything, and just loves other beings. And so traditionally, um, this, this experience of being utterly stunned, um, and in that, any construction of self disappears, any construction of lover and beloved even disappears. And so the, uh, there's traditional teaching that hardly anyone has realized this, meaning the one who realizes this is not the one you might think. In other words, it's, if someone says, oh, I experienced Kundalini, uh, and they have a picture of it, a memory of it, no, they only have things that manifested in the mind as metaphors or stamps and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's often, so the best reaction is someone says, oh, I've had this wonderful Kundalini experience. And we go, sure. Um, or they think, you know, just bow down to me and it will awaken. And, and, the, and the Kundalini experience that people sometimes have can be frightening. So, you yes. know, so that is also something to be aware of. That, it, you know, it might be, oh, it's wonderful and I feel like I'm going to dominate the world. Or it could be very frightening. Um, if it's, if it, yeah, these are the if you have not, yeah, yeah initial, that kind. Yeah. And so if you, regardless of whether, um, you know, you, your ego has inflated or deflated or become uh, fractured by an experience like that, um, what is the most valuable thing you can do at that point is to Start over. It's the sign that you're almost ready to begin the actual practice of yoga. Um, And it is really tied to this thing we always emphasize, but that you were speaking about so well earlier, of the interaction between this pattern of the apana grounding us and then the prana dropping down to meet the apana, the apana rising up to meet the prana, the prana right dropping down to meet the yeah. apana, and visualizing that or doing a breath uh, exercise, a breathing exercise by emphasizing the exhale, um, whether you feel inflated or deflated or scared or confused, or if you've never even had a kundalini experience, those that is an incredible kind of path towards the um, building of capacity to drop into this midline, into the middle path, into the unification of past and future, which puts you in the present, so that you find balance even in difficult times. So, if you have if you have an experience. Mm-hmm. So from a non-dual point of view, everything is a Kundalini experience. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. But if you have these experiences, it means that the basic practice is starting to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing to do then is to release 
the reaction to that experience rather than grasping onto it and to come back into the present and look a little more closely. So the mind says, oh, that's the Kundalini experience. And you see that thought arising and you can just notice that thought arising rather than believing it or disbelieving it. And that can be difficult. Oh, yeah, because it's like, and it, it all kind of recycles back through uh, this interconnection with all other beings. And, and part of what is, in, in our opinion, the beauty, or at least my opinion, the beauty of these uh, yoga practices is this notion that we've discussed in the last few talks of setting things down, of tyag, or, or you know, abhyasa vairagyam, putting things down, so that you have to collect things. So maybe in this sense, you know, the kundalini is something that, that has happened, but then you set it down almost as if it is an offering to others. And part of the beauty of these practices is that typically these kinds of experiences that could throw us way off balance, like being um, identified with the Kundalini experience, um, that they don't pop up necessarily the very first time you practice. That often, if you've practiced putting things down, practiced you know, putting your ego down when you finally get your leg behind your head or you finally learn to do Utita Hasta Padangushtasana without hopping around the room, that, that that ability to put things down is then in your nervous system enough so that when some of the more esoteric things begin to um, present themselves or more abstract thoughts that might frighten or enamor you when they start to manifest, you're well practiced at the idea of, oh, letting him go. Oh, letting him go. And so that story of the Roshi, who there's, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite Zen little quick stories, which is the student who um, has been practicing diligently at this Zen uh, center for, for years and years, and seeing all these other people kind of looking like they're making a lot of headway, and then one day this person's practicing and, you know, everything comes together and the lights of heaven um, shine down upon this person and the sky is open and angels, angels appear. and Bodhisattvas appear. Yeah, and everything lines up and makes sense, and so this person gets up and goes to the Roshi and says, oh, Roshi, I just have to tell you that finally, you know, you kept telling me to keep practicing, and finally, you know, this morning in my practice, you're right, you know, I, I experienced it, and, and I'm enlightened. I had this experience of enlightenment. I'm so happy. Thank you. And the Roshi is very sweet and says, that's just wonderful. Now, keep practicing. And that's what we all have to remember, is that... Yeah, put it down. Put it down. And keep... Start over. Keep practicing.